Okay, well, I think I'll do like the slow, the slow rolling start. Um, and hopefully we'll get a few more people on here. We had about, I think about 15 people actually registered. So hopefully a few more people join us. Uh, so my name is Sarah Bostic, and I'm the Sustainable Agriculture Extension Agent um, in Sarasota County with the University of Florida. Um, and um, I have been growing collard greens and um, other things in that same family of vegetables for many, many years. Um, I actually was a commercial farmer for about 16 years um, and have more recently switched over to um, helping, um, helping folks be the best uh, growers and producers they can and helping the general public figure out um, how to grow, um, grow at home. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, uh, but before we really get started, um, um, so we're gonna try to, I'm gonna aim for about an hour. We're gonna keep all of you on mute um, it, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because if, um, if folks aren't on mute, we get some really strange background noise and then it's hard to hear who's actually talking. Um, and the second reason we're gonna keep folks on mute is just as a added security feature. Um, Cause I'm sure y'all have seen in the news that there's some, sometimes some odd things that happen on Zoom these days. So um, I, we're just gonna keep everyone on mute um, to keep things moving well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, so that you can see a PowerPoint that I put together. Um, and I am going to, um, okay, um, Katie or Kevin, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you see, see that screen? Great, okay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do this presentation more or less as if we were in person together. Um, and this actually is um, a, a workshop that I first did in person in our office um, and a lot of it actually out in our demo garden. So this was initially intended to be a hands-on workshop, but um, for, the, for this moment in time, this is as close as we're getting to hands-on. Um, so I'm going to try to talk for about an hour. Um, if you have some really pressing questions, um, during the um, during the actual um, the actual class, go ahead and type them in the um, in the chat box. Actually, pressing questions or not, any um, and at the very end, um, like that last hour that we have together, um, I'm going to address all of the questions. Um, but if you have um, if you have any pressing questions that need to be answered more quickly, um, where something in the technology is not working or you just have absolutely no idea idea what I'm talking about, um, my um, wonderful coworker Katie, who is on the line, will flag me down um, and get me to stop talking for a minute um, and address whatever issues are going on. So that's, that's the general gist of how we're going to make this happen today. So we're going to dive right on in. Okay, so part of the title of this class um, had the word brassica in it. Um, and most folks have absolutely no idea whatsoever what a brassica is. Um, and we are indeed um, mostly going to talk about collard greens today, um, but I think it's really, really helpful to start by framing out kind of where, where do collard greens fit in, in the grand scheme of, of plants, because that helps you really be able to generalize a lot of information. Um, so if you know how to grow collard greens really well, and you know what's related to collard greens, um, you have a pretty good idea of how to take care of some other plants successfully. So to start that with, um, it's just some of that basic, maybe you remember um, way back in college or high school, um, some basic taxonomy, um, you know, things like domain, kingdom, phylum, class. I could never keep track of these, so I had to come up with all sorts of, um, I can't remember what they're called, but like little idiom sorts of things, um, like Dear King Philip came over for good soup um, to try to remember how, how everything related. So that still does not explain what a brassica is. Um, but this is how it fits in the general um, scheme of things. So if you scroll, um, and Katie or Kevin, can you see the, the arrow on my screen? Is, yeah, Kevin can. Okay, great. Um, so if you get about halfway down this chart, um, you see there's this, um, this order of plants called the brassicales, and it includes all sorts of things. Um, capers, moringa, papaya, collard greens. Um, and then you get a little more specific down to the families. And there's a family called Brassicaceae that actually has 3,700 species in it, and they are all types of mustards. Um, and then one more step down to get even more specific to the kind of plants, you get to a genus called Brassica. Um, 
and that contains about 37 species and we eat almost all of those um, somewhere on the planet. And then if you get down to the species level, there is a species called Brassica oleraceae, um, which started as a wild cabbage. So this is, to me, a, is really interesting. Um, wild move picture, I'm looking at, there we go. Okay, I can see my own screen better now. So um, wild cabbage, um, the best guess is that it actually popped up somewhere around 2,500 years ago in Europe. Um, and over time, humans selected for different traits that they really liked, different characteristics in that wild mustard. And the result is about seven different really distinct kinds of vegetables that we think of as being different vegetables, but they're actually the same species. Um, and that, that list is broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, kale, and kohlrabi. They are botanically the same plant. You know, and most people would never look at a head of cabbage um, and kale and think that they were the same plant, but they actually botanically are. Um, we've just selected for different parts of that plant to be, to be more significant. So if you, if you step it back um, a couple of notches again on that taxonomic tree, um, to, back to the Brassicaceae family, um, there's a bunch of other plants that we very commonly eat that we also that um, that are also part of that family that collards are in things like arugula, bok choy, um, all the different kinds of mustard, including you know like regular old yellow mustard that you squirt on your hot dog, um, turnips, radishes, um, all sorts of things like that, and um, the um, the kind of um, oil that we call canola oil actually comes from a mustard. So you, don't, you really don't need to know these fancy words at all. It's just really helpful if you're digging around and trying to do some of your own research. Um, sometimes if you type in um, brassica or brassica family, you'll find a lot of information about, about growing things that are more geared towards professional growers. So they tend to have a lot more information available. Um, but most folks call, you know, call collards and everything related to them, you know, like the mustard family or the cabbage family. Some parts of the country you'll hear them called crucifers or coal crops. So why, why is it useful to know um, about vegetable families? Um, and, and so really it's just that if you know about one vegetable, um, if you know the characteristics of a vegetable family, um, then um, you, you can really generalize. Um, so like plants in one family all tend to have really similar pests, diseases, climate preferences, temperature preferences, susceptibility to nematodes. Um, and we'll talk more about nematodes a little bit later. Most, most folks have never heard of a nematode and they are, they're a pretty neat little creature. It's one of the most, um, most prolific creatures on earth and most of us have never heard of it. Um, and then plants in, in one family also tend to have really similar fertility needs. So we're gonna focus on collard greens today, but, um, but this will really help you um, generalize to other plants that are in that same family. So it's also um, fairly easy with a lot of plant families, especially the vegetable families, to figure out what's related to each other because the plants in one family tend to have really similar looking seeds, flowers, leaves, and when, they're cr and when the leaves are crushed, also tend to have a similar smell. So there's an example of, um, of seeds. I actually don't remember what kind of brassica seed this is. Um, I just, I had all, you know, a whole pile of seeds um, and I poured some on a um, college rule sheet of paper. Um, and you can see that this is, this is what um, brassica seeds look like. They all look something like this, slightly different sizes or slightly different colors, but about like that. Um, and in, in person, I asked the question um, of who, um, who has a guess as to what kind of brassica this is? Um, but we don't have the capacity to do that at the moment. So I'm just going to tell you what kind of brassica this is. Um, this is the brassica that canola oil is made from. Um, it is um, most typically grown in um, all across central Canada and large swaths of, um, of, of Eurasia. Um, huge, huge fields of this annual mustard that we then um, collect the seeds and press into canola oil. 
and take a good look at, um, at those flowers that you can see there because those flowers look pretty darn similar regardless of what brassica you're talking about. Um, these are, um, that's a, um, a broccoli flower right there that that bee is on. Um, and brassica flowers generally come in either white or yellow color. Okay, so they also, um, as I already mentioned, have really similar, um, similar characteristics to their leaves. Um, so all of those brassicas that are most closely related to collards, um, like kale, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, um, cauliflower, kohlrabi, they all have really thick, tough, waxy leaves when they're, um, they're fully mature. Um, and then their leaves also look really similar when they're young. Um, when they're very, very young, um, it can be really hard to tell the difference. Um, and that's a pretty, pretty good key, um, a, a pretty good clue as to how closely related um, that list of plants are. Because um, when they're young, it's, you, you sometimes really truly have trouble telling them apart. So here's a picture. This is actually from our demo garden just a few months ago. Um, and you can see on the, um, I believe it's on your left. I'm actually, actually not sure if the screen is flipped for you or not, but um, um, the mature collard, uh, mature cauliflower leaves on the left and the immature collard leaves on the right, um, they look really similar. Um, and so you can see that as they get older, they get a waxy, um, a waxy finish to them. And that's pretty, pretty solid characteristic, characteristic of that type of brassica. Okay, so we also said similar smell. Um, and so there's a, a lot of folks really don't like the smell of cooking brassicas, like cooking broccoli or um, collard greens that are cooking. Um, and um, you know, people tend to describe it as like kind of like a little bit of a farty smell. Um, well, there's actually a really distinct reason for that. Um, and it's because brassicas are full of a particular phytochemical called uh, glucose, I can't ever say this word, glucosinolates, um, which are a sulfur containing compound. So, you know, rotten eggs, for example, also contain a lot of sulfur. So it's that, that's the smell that you generally don't like. Um, and if you really want to avoid that smell, like if you really want to eat kale and collards and things like that, but you just really don't love how they smell when they're cooked and you can't get over that smell, Try, try eating them raw. Um, it's, um, you just, it's a really different experience because it's that, it's that process of you know, crushing that, that actually releases that chemical. Um, and at the very end, we're actually, we're, I'm gonna go through a bunch of recipes that you can try um, and a lot of them are raw. Um, I love, I love brassicas raw. Yeah. Okay. So um, we also mentioned that um, it is really useful to know um, that plants in one family also have similar pests, diseases, climate preferences, temperature preferences, susceptibility to nematodes, and fertility needs. So I'm going to dive in right now to this whole list um, and just go, um, go through this. And my focus is going to be on collards, but for the most part, you can really take this information and apply it to pretty much any kind of brassica that you would want to grow. So um, there, there's lots of things that love to eat brassicas. Um, and um, I actually left, left an, a couple, a handful of them off of here, but these are, these are some of the most common ones that you'll find. Um, so in this picture right here, you can see, I think, move this out of the way real quick. Um, yeah, you can see three of these little fuzzy green worms here, here, here on one immature collard leaf. Um, those are those are a variety of caterpillar called um, cabbage loopers, um, and they eat and eat and eat and eat um, incredibly quickly. Um, some of the other pests that really like collards and other brassicas are aphids, um, cutworms, which come out at night and snip plants off right at the bottom. Um, fire ants, grasshoppers, um, silverleaf whitefly. And um, you know, things like silverleaf whitefly and aphids, they, they, um, they literally will puncture with their little puncturing mouthpiece right into the, um, the leaves. And then they, with their, their mouthpiece is built like a straw. And they use that straw-like mouthpiece to literally suck the fluid out of the plants. Um, and um, to add insult to injury, um, so they have a really similar mouthpiece to a mosquito. 
So if you think about how mosquitoes can sometimes be vectors for things like, um, like malaria, mosquito um, will bites a person and before they suck in, a little bit of liquid from whoever they bit previously comes out. Um, and it's that fluid that comes out of the mosquito before it starts to suck your blood in um, that actually is passing diseases along. Um, that's exactly how um, insects like aphids and white flies can pass, um, pass diseases between plants. Um, and so those, um, you know, aphids seem like they can be kind of innocuous, like not particularly a big deal, um, but they actually, they do, they do spread all around a lot of diseases. Um, and then both white flies and, and aphids um, excrete this, it sounds delightful, they excrete something called honeydew, which is a, a very nice way of saying poop, um, onto the, the, the leaves of the plants. And this honeydew or, or insect poop um, is the perfect place for certain kinds of mold to grow. They really like it. Um, and so that's another way that some of these insects, even if they're not chewing leaves, they can have a lot of really significant impacts. Um, so there, there's so many different insects that can impact um, collards and other brassicas um, and correctly identifying them is really the first step in figuring out how to control them. It can be really tricky to figure it out. Um, I, I love um, this, um, let's see, this right here, this website, this insectidentification.org. Um, it has truly beautiful, beautiful um, detailed pictures, really close up pictures of of insects um, and it's um, you can search by state so it's like it's the insects that are specific to Florida that you can find um, and it's a really neat way to try to identify what's growing in your garden. You can also um, send in good quality pictures to our office. Um, we can also help you send in um, samples to, um, to some labs and some online um, identification sources. Um, and if you know you have some um, plant disease issues, we can also help you figure out the best way to get those tested. Okay, so I'm going to dive in a little bit further into aphids um, because I think it's really, really helpful to just have a framework about, about how to think about approaching insect and pest management in your garden. Um, because it's really probably the hardest thing about having a garden in Florida is just controlling the incredible amount of uh, insects and, and diseases that affect plants. Um, we're in this really interesting place um, geographically where um, basically the, the climate that's, that's just south of us and the climate that's just north of us, we, we're basically at the meeting point of those two climates. And so that means that the vast majority of the insects that are really common um, in the you know thousand-ish miles south of us are also common here, and same thing goes for the insects that are really common in the thousand-ish miles north of us. So we're basically at this point where we have two different climate zones insects, um, and so thinking about how to control all of these um, insects and diseases, I think, is really helpful. So this is um, these are two pictures that I took a few um, a few years ago. Um, of, of plants that I was growing. I was traveling a lot for work and not able to pay enough attention to them. And you can, you can see that I had an aphid infestation. It was really, really bad. Um, so the plant, um, these, are, these are two red Russian um, kale plants, which are very closely, whoops, wrong way, very closely related to collard greens. They were from the same batch of seeds, the same seedlings, planted on the same day, taken care of in all the same ways. The one on the left, this one right here, got a really bad aphid infestation. The one on the right did not. So you can see what an impact something like aphids can have. That's the back of an aphid leaf. And if you looked at these plants, you didn't see a whole lot of aphids on the top of the leaves. They were pretty much just on the back of the leaves, and that's pretty common. And we'll, I'll talk about why in just a minute. So when I, when I figure out how to control um, a type of insect, control or prevent a type of insect that I'm not familiar with, the first thing that I do is learn, learn everything I can about it. Um, and that's really the key to learning how to manage the, the insects. Um, they, they, they come from somewhere and there's something about the scenario that makes them happy to be there. And you need to know what those two things are in order to have a good plan to, to reverse things. So with aphids, 
um, a starting point is, you know, so where do they, where do they come from? Well, um, a lot of them have wings, um, so they, they fly in. Um, not all aphids develop wings, but when, um, so if you, I'm gonna go back a page. So with, with this, um, this picture right here, where there's such an incredibly dense population of aphids on, on this leaf here, um, some of this is becoming too many aphids for one leaf. And so some of these adults are going to um, sprout wings and fly off to the next plant and start a new population there. So that's how wings happen. It's, it's when, when their overall population in one spot gets to be too great. So they can actually birth live young or lay eggs. They're one of the only insects that can do that. Um, I wasn't able to find a picture that I actually have um, the copyright access to, um, to show you live birth of aphids. Um, and so I can't show you the picture, but if you Google um, live birth aphid, um, there's some truly incredible images um, out there of an insect giving live birth. It's kind of wild. Um, and then in warm weather, a new generation is born every seven to 10 days. So that's certainly part of where they come from. They just, they regenerate very, very quickly. Um, and then each female births um, you know, 40 to 60 new aphids. And so very quickly um, you get an explosion of aphids. Um, not an issue here, um, but they can survive sub-zero temperatures. So even when we have little cold, cold snaps down here, it's not gonna do anything to the aphid population. Um, they're really good at overwintering on different host plants. Um, and then some aphids are generalists. They'll suck the juice out of any old plant, um, but some are really specific to certain kinds of plants. And then what makes them thrive? So this is, this is particularly important. Um, the things that make aphids thrive the most are really just these, um, these five things. Um, a lack of natural predators, or these four things rather, a lack of natural predators. And the way that we accomplish a lack of natural predators in our garden scenarios um, and in our landscapes in general is overuse of broad spectrum insecticides and in, insufficient habitat um, for, for insect life in general. Um, and then they also need really, really abundant, juicy new growth um, on plants. And so having lots of young plants around um, is a great way to keep um, aphids happy. Um, and really high nitrogen levels in the soil that the plants are pulling up. So plants that are overly full of nitrogen also really makes aphid populations uh, boom. And then they really, really need indirect light, aka the underside of leaves, right? So I'm going to go back to this picture real quick again. You know, this, um, this is the underside of a leaf, and you couldn't really see any aphids at all on the top side. So it is, that's a really important thing to keep in mind, is that they, they really need that protected under, under leaf area. Okay. So most folks know that ladybugs um, eat aphids, um, and I'm showing you this picture um, in part just to remind you of that, but also because this is a, um, an atypical color of aphids, um, and I put this picture on here because um, as a reminder that aphids come in lots and lots of different colors. Um, they most, um, we most generally see them as pale green, but they're also purple, orange, pink, um, black. There's so many colors that aphids come in. Okay, so this, you don't, you don't need to read this, um, but I just wanted to show you this. This is something that I developed for farmers a few years ago who were learning, um, learning how to do this thing called um, IPM, which stands for Integrated Pest Management. And it's really um, like a sustainable agriculture tool that farmers use um, to think through like a whole system approach to, to pest and disease management. So rather than just saying, I have a problem, I'm going to spray it, it's a whole process of thinking through how, how can I actually prevent it. So when I'm working with farmers that are struggling with some pest control, um, this is a process that I walk through with them. Um, and, um, and I'm going to show you how this works on a garden. So the first, the first stage that I start with is more the big picture of the space that you're working with. So, you know, for home gardeners, it's thinking about how, like, what kind of preventative practices can you weave into um, your yard or the property that you're on, um, or, you know, just kind of your surrounding space. Um, like, how are you managing that overall space that has, um, that has, you know, your collards or whatever vegetables in it. And there's um, the things that are highlighted in red 
are the things that are the relevant management practices for aphids. So I'm going to use this, um, I'm going to go through this whole process using aphids as an example. So for your yard or the or your urban property or your rural property, um, the most important thing really is making sure there's habitat for beneficial insects. And so, you know, making sure that there's more than just lawn and then maybe a, you know, a four by eight garden bed for your vegetables on um, plants. You need to have other native plants around in order to have place for the native insects that can control aphid populations. Um, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide is a pretty incredible, not pretty incredible, it's a truly incredible guide to selecting um, native and Florida friendly landscaping plants, um, as well as um, a lot of designs for your, your um, a Florida friendly landscape. Um, our office, when it's open, um, does a whole lot of work with the, with the, pub, with the public, there we go, on, um, on Florida friendly landscaping. So we also have this book for free in our office when our office is open um, and we will know we will know soon when that will be. Um, but making sure that your, your yard has places for native, um, native insects that eat aphids to actually live, that's a really important piece. So the next layer that I think about when I'm controlling insects and managing for insects is managing the actual crop. You know? And so for your garden, that may be only you know, two or three collard plants and a couple of tomatoes and things like that, but it's still exactly the same principles. So for managing aphids, it's things like making sure that your plants are up off the ground. You know, so if you have a strong wind and it blows a collard plant over, prop it back up because that contact with the ground creates even more shade for those, those plants, which means more nice shady um, space for aphids to hang out. Uh, make sure you get, get rid of diseased plants. Um, make sure that your plants are getting um, not too much water, but just enough. Um, you know, plants that are really full of water are really juicy and aphids are pulling juice out of plants. And so you don't want a plant that's so full of water um, that it's even more um, tempting for aphids. Doing a little interplanting, um, planting, um, planting other plants that have really strong smell, things like calendula, marigolds, um, even onions, things like that um, can really help. Um, sufficient nutrition, um, and when I say sufficient, I mean not too much and not um, not in, in, and not not enough. So remember, um, nit excess nitrogen is one of the things that really pulls aphids in. And so when you over fertilize plants, you you literally are creating aphid infestations. Um, so making sure that you're not over fertilizing is really important. Um, you know, and then and there's there's other things there. You can read them, um, but that you kind of get the you get the idea. Um, and then the next layer. So we've gone from property management to crop management to the actual variety that of of um, of the crop that you're or the vegetable that you're picking. So you know, not just the, like I'm going to grow um, collards, but making sure it's you know it's a variety that does really well here in our hot, humid climate. Um, and then you know making sure that it's really um, just like the right the right variety um, you know and if you're picking something like kale there's actually dozens of varieties of kale um, some of them are made for really cold winter conditions like they like to be in the 30s and 40s um, temperature wise and they just won't do well here in the winter um, and, the, and that makes them more susceptible to insect damage so making sure that you're you're picking the right the right varieties and then um, so we've got you know property management and then crop management and then picking the right variety and then if, if all else fails you can also simply put a physical barrier or some sort of detractor over over the what you're growing um, this is a picture um, of um, of a type of product that's relatively recently developed um, that it's like an, a really um, it's an insect netting that's been developed to not hold in a lot of heat. It's really good for southern growers. Um, and um, the price is still relatively high on a lot of insect netting, but it's starting to come down as it's becoming, yeah, now that it's been out on the market for a few years. Um, so you can literally just cover your plants and that helps to keep a lot of insects, including aphids, off of them. Um, and then keeping your plants mulched, so like keeping that 
keeping the, the soil covered is really helpful um, because keeping soil covered helps to keep the temperature of the soil much more stable and the amount of moisture in the soil much more stable. And both of those things help to prevent a lot of stress in your, in your garden plants. And then the last um, and probably most important part of this whole idea of integrated pest management, we look at a whole bunch of different systems in a whole bunch of different ways to try to prevent and manage insect and pest pressure is to learn, is to observe and learn from, from what you're seeing in your garden. So keep a little journal or a scrap of paper or some notes in your smartphone. Um, and you know, at least once a week, go out there and just intentionally notice. Um, pick leaves up and you know, turn them over to see what's happening on the backside because that's where most of the action is happening. Um, notice, you know, like after a big rain, you know, what happens? Is there an you know, outbreak of a disease or a pest or something like that? Um, just really start to notice um, what's happening out there and keep notes. Um, and if you keep notes for a few years, you will actually be able to start um, predicting when you're going to see different kinds of pest or disease outbreaks. Um, you'll start to notice a pattern. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. Um, I highly encourage you to give it a try. Um, okay, and so just one more really um, neat little note on aphids. Um, so aphids, um, using, what did I write on here? Aphids, using observation as a tool. That's right, that's a great, that's a great thing. Um, I forgot that I put this slide in there and I had to remind myself why I put this slide in here. Um, so if you look at this leaf right here, um, there are, it looks like there's a whole lot of different things happening on this leaf, right? Um, and there are, but there's actually, um, I believe there's actually only three different types of insects on there. There are aphids in about four different life stages. Um, and then this, let's see, where's my cursor? Let me try to point for you guys. I can't find, there it is, there's my cursor. This little insect right here, um, I would love to be able to ask you in person who recognizes this insect. Um, this is one of the larval stages of a ladybug. Um, they look like creepy little um, little dragon insects that couldn't possibly be doing anything good, but they are aphid eating machines. So I would encourage you to learn how to recognize ladybug larvae. Um, and then also a funny, funny looking little insect on the same leaf right there. That's a lacewing in, um, larvae. Um, that's the adult of a lacewing over here. This is the larvae right here. Um, they also are aphid eating machines. So I would encourage you to, to recognize both of those. Um, and then this, this is a really strange looking thing happening right here, but this is very, very neat. So this, this funny kind of peach colored aphid um, is actually um, something actually quite gruesome happening to this aphid right here. Um, uh, um, a predatory wasp is laying eggs into the aphid. Um, it pierces right through the, the body of the aphid and lays its eggs, um, which is um, probably, probably one of the more horrible things to happen to one in life. Um, but the, the result is this. You see this strange brown thing that almost looks like a bloated cricket? Um, that's called a mummified aphid. Um, so you can see on the picture at the top, you can see some of these strange little brown things those are mummified aphids. These are aphids that have not been mummified here. So when, when the eggs um, of this parasitic wasp hatch, they, um, they, eat, they eat the inside of the aphids out and the, the outside of the aphid um, basically becomes a hard shell and mummifies. And then when the, the wasp larvae are ready to hatch, they eat their way through the aphid. I know this is a horribly gruesome subject, um, but this is, this is how nature controls pest outbreaks. Um, and then the whole cycle starts again. And so if you see mummified aphids on your plants, leave them there. That's the start of really good things. Um, you can trust that, that the, the processes are, they're, they're, they're working, right? So you can, you can kind of back off and see, see how nature does its thing. 
Um, not going to get into brassica diseases. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Um, it can be very, very hard to tell the difference between them. Um, really, the only way to know 100% for sure which, which disease you're working, for, uh, working with is to send a tissue sample off to a lab to get tested under a microscope. Um, but you can make some generalizations about the, the brassica diseases. So what causes brassica diseases? Um, you know, it, it's, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty um, standard set of things. Um, most of them like either very cool, moist weather or hot, moist weather. Um, and so making sure that you're controlling as best as you can for excess moisture is very, very helpful. Um, downy mildew, um, this is actually just, I, I cut and pasted directly from a, a website. You can see a whole, whole website that's dedicated to um, diagnosing plant diseases. Um, but this is um, on, on collared seedlings, um, and these collared seedlings have downy mildew. Um, and you can see the front and the back of those leaves there and what that looks like. Um, so downy mildew, you know, they, they actually prefer our winter temperatures to our summer temperatures. Oops, that's my phone making noise. Let me turn the volume off. Um, and then um, the, the spores of downy mildew are spread by um, infected seedlings. So making sure you're starting with healthy seedlings is really important. Um, they can also simply just blow in on the wind from other infected plants. Um, and so if you have sick plants or dead plants um, or plants that seem diseased, the, really the best thing to do is actually to get them, get them gone, um, put them in the trash, um, bury them really deep in the compost bin if you feel the need to compost them. But generally just fully taking them out of the system is a better idea. It's hard to get the temperature of a home compost bin hot, hot enough to actually kill, kill mold spores. Okay, so this is a really helpful um, vantage point to think about um, think about collard greens and other plants. Like if you know where they are commonly eaten, um, you have a you have a good idea of what their ideal growing conditions are. So collard greens are very commonly eaten around the world in the southeastern United States, Brazil, East and Central Africa, um, the middle parts of the Middle East, and Portugal. So what do these regions have in common? Um, and the number one thing is they are hot. They are really, really hot. Um, most of these places are also really, really humid. Um, not all of them, but um, hot and humid is kind of the magic combination for, for collard greens. So when you're trying to figure out, so let me back up really quickly. Um, most of the folks that, um, that we see come through our office um, and that come to my classes and that you know, give me a call because they're trying to figure out um, how in the world to grow this, that, or the other are people who are not from Florida. They have moved here you know, in the last two or three or 10 years and um, they, they almost always tell me, you know, I was such a great gardener um, you know, back in Michigan or Connecticut or you know, Ohio or wherever I moved from. I always thought of myself as someone with a green thumb and then I moved to Florida. What happened to my green thumb? All of a sudden I can't seem to keep anything alive. Well, um, it, I, I also have actually gone through that same process because um, uh, I farmed for many years in New England. I grew up in the Southeast and then farmed for many years, years in New England and then about four years ago moved down to Florida and I felt like I was starting from scratch on a lot of levels. Um, you know, I had farmed for 16 years and still my learning curve when I moved to Florida and started farming down here was very significant. And so I had to start thinking about things in ways that I'd never thought about them before. Like when I was trying to figure out the right time to plant things, um, everything about it was just different. So one of the things that I started really paying a lot of attention to is the structure of a plant, because that tells you a lot about what that plant um, like where that plant normalized to, like where it's from, right? And so collard greens um, have a really open, loose leaf structure, right? Like there's, um, there's a lot of space between the leaves. Um, the leaves are big and broad and open. Um, that's the structure of a plant that's made for heat, made for lots of heat. Um, you know, if you think about what you want to wear when it's really hot outside, 
it's not it's not a whole lot of layers of tight clothing, right? It's kind of loose, flowy clothing. It's the same for plants. Um, and then if you look at a cabbage, which is botanically the same plant as a collard, um, it has a very, very different leaf structure, right? And so um, cabbage is, um, is from a much cooler part of the world. Um, it's made for a much cooler climate. You can absolutely grow um, cabbage and grow it well in Florida. You just have to grow it um, solidly in the winter. Um, so that's, you know, like when you look at plants, um, you can learn so much about what they are going to want. Um, and so, you know, like for me, when I was trying to figure out the best time to plant things um, in Florida, um, being able to look at the structure of a plant was really helpful to me. You know, you can just kind of intuit that like something that's that dense and tight is like kind of curled up for cold weather. Okay. So when, so when do, when do you plant things? Um, it can be kind of hard to figure out when to plant what um, in our region of Florida. Um, this is a really neat series that the University of Florida has put out. Um, uh, it's um, like little charts about what you can plant when in the three different regions of Florida. We are, we basically are in that, like have one foot in central Florida and one foot in south Florida here. And so figuring out what to plant when is a little dicey here, um, but um, you know, get, maybe give the central and the south a try, and then you'll have a pretty good, um, you know, pretty good idea of, of where you are on that spectrum. Um, but um, you know, so January is really our prime, one of our prime planting times down here. And then we get to May, and you see that that, that list has become smaller for sure. Um, and May starts in two days. Um, so you can see on the central Florida planting list, you've got collard greens that are still good to plant in, um, in May, but they've already dropped off the list for, um, for the south part of Florida because it's just so hot and humid that even collard greens get stressed by the amount of heat and, heat and um, intense rain that we get in the summer down here. And then by the time you roll around to July, Unless, unless you really like okra and sweet potatoes, you're out of luck for a couple of months. Um, it'll still be, still be a few months before you can plant again. So if you want to grow collard greens, um, I would highly recommend getting them in sometime in the next few days. Um, otherwise, you're gonna have to wait, um, in, wait a few months before you put them in. So um, it, can, it can just be really tricky to figure out when to plant things, you know, um, and the best way to plant things for Florida because it's just different. It just is. Um, and this is a book um, that you can actually get through the University of Florida's um, bookstore called Vegetable Gardening in Florida. It is a book written by a Florida producer um, specifically for gardening in Florida. Um, it's really good. Um, it has, let me see. Well, I'm trying to move this out of the way so I can see it better. Um, you can see it here up at the top. It gives you planting dates for north, central, and south parts of Florida. Um, and I believe, well, they don't even have collard greens on this page. I think they just have a page on here called greens. Um, but it's a great book if you need a little extra help figuring things out. Okay, so nematodes. Um, Nematodes are a really complicated um, little organism. Um, the, the type of nematodes that we are really concerned about when we're gardening are called plant parasitic nematodes. So they are a microscopic roundworm. There's about 20,000 different species of nematodes. Um, in one spoonful of soil in Florida, um, you can have tens of thousands of nematodes which is a pretty incredible thing. So that, that gives you an idea of how big they are. Um, this is a, you know, a very microscopic look at one type of, of nematode. Um, there's, there's about half a dozen different types of nematodes that are particularly problematic in gardens down here. This is a picture of what um, root knot nematode looks, damage looks like on uh, cucumber plants. Um, these cucumber plants were growing out at the, um, in our demo garden. Um, and nematodes are actually um, the, the biggest 
place that nematodes are a problem is in raised beds. So if you have like a four by four or you know four by eight raised bed, um, you will you will have more issues with nematodes in that than you will um, if you are growing um, directly in the ground. Um, which is not to say that it's impossible. It just means that there's another layer of, of management you're going to have to figure out. Um, and so basically what happens with nematodes is that they um, they just say, can I do this? I have a, just a little, I'm going to show you a really short video. These little guys swim around um, and then they literally just um, bore into the root system of plants. Um, and they... Um, they get in there and they make these little galls, those little knots. Um, and um, this this one is actually not a, a, a um, not a plant parasitic nematode, but I couldn't find a good video of one that was. But this is basically what nematodes look like. They um, they just bur burrow into the root system, and then you get those funny little knots. Actually, that's pretty neat. So you can see. There we go. This is a really, really large variety of nematode. Um, this is one of the largest ones in the world. All the ones that are parasitic to, to plants um, are not visible with the naked eye. Kind of wild, huh? Um, okay, so enough of that one. Oh, got to figure out how to get out of that. Okay, there we go. Um, looks like I have some strange scribbles on my screen. I don't know where this came from. Hopefully that's not the beginning of something strange happening. Um, okay, so here's some good news though. Um, brassicas um, actually don't, don't have a lot of damage from nematodes. Um, nematodes tend to like the kinds of plants um, that produce sweet things. Um, so, um, you know, things like tomatoes, eggplants, cucumbers, a lot of the fruit producing plants are most susceptible to nematodes. Um, and um, there, um, there's a really distinct reason that nematodes do not particularly like um, the brassicas. And this, by the way, when I taught this class in person, people were like, why are you showing me a picture of pizza with arugula on it? It's because it's my favorite kind of pizza. Um, I, love, I love arugula, which is a kind of brassica on pizza. This was, so um, it was just a silly picture. <laughs> um, so um, that so that same smell that a lot of people don't like when they smell brassicas cooking um, is that same sulfur-containing compound that when it's when it's breaking down and releasing that sulfury smell also helps to control nematode population. So if you do not like how rotting or cooking brassicas smell, you have something in common with a plant parasitic roundworm. Um, lucky you, huh? Um, so there's a couple of things to know about that. One is that um, if you're really struggling with um, plants that just seem like they're failing to survive and you pull them out and they have those strange little galls on the bottom, you have a pretty significant nematode infestation. Brassicas are one of the families of plants that you can grow and not struggle too much with those nematodes. You'll have a little bit of damage, but not nearly what you'll have with other plants. And then the second thing to know about that is that um, using brassicas to help actually decrease your nematode population is a pretty good option. There's not a huge amount of really concrete research that's been done on this, um, but there, the, the body of research is really growing. and it is trending towards showing that if you, um, if you actually just kind of like bury your, um, your brassicas when you're done with them in the soil and let them break down, that while they're breaking down, they, help, they really help decrease the nematode population and allow you to grow other things more successfully. Yeah, there's some, there is some strange scribbles on my screen. I don't know if y'all can see that. Um, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause really quickly just to say that um, if, um, if, um, if we are getting Zoom bombed at some point during this, um, one of my coworkers is simply just going to end, um, end the session um, and it'll, the screen is just going to go blank and we'll follow up with an email. Um, I very, very much hope, and, um, hope that that is not going to happen. Um, I don't think that it is going to happen, but there are some odd little scribbles on my screen. I'm not sure if y'all can see them or not, but I can. Um, let's see. I see something in chat. I'm just going to look. 
Kevin says, check to make sure you haven't annotated the screen. I don't know what that is. So, um, oh, that's gone. Okay. I think Kevin unannotated my screen for me, which is exactly why I have um, coworkers who are very technologically savvy on here with me. And I um, appreciate y'all very, very much. Okay. So, um, so the next, the next stage in trying to figure out how to successfully grow collard greens is when do you fertilize these things um, and, and brassicas in general. So um, I like to break it down into four different chunks. Let me see, sorry, one more little chat. I'm just gonna check it. Okay, yep, Kevin saved it. Cleared the screen of annotations that I managed to manifest. I have no idea how I did that, but I did. Um, so single harvest leafy greens um, are, you know, things like, um, trying to think. So like if you're, if you're harvesting the whole head of bok choy or the whole head of cabbage, um, you generally, well actually cabbage is not a good, not a good example because it's in the ground for so long, but a lot of the small, you know, like one harvest and it's done, you really only need to plant them um, to, to fertilize when you plant them because they're just not in the ground all that long. Um, and then multiple harvest greens, so things that you pick multiple times, like collards, kale, mustards, um, things like that, um, you generally need to fertilize them a couple of times, once when you're planting, and then generally a few weeks after your first harvest. Let's see, now my screen isn't changing. Hey, Kevin, my screen's not, not changing. Any idea why? There we go. Never mind. Um, okay, so um, root crops um, are really a um, kind of a category to themselves. So things like radishes and small turnips, like those little hawkeye um, turnips that you can get sometimes in specialty markets or the farmer's market, um, you should really only, only fertilize those when you're planting them. If you give them too much fertilizer, not only are they more likely to get aphids, um, but more of the energy of that plant goes into the greens and it doesn't go into the part of the plant that you're, you're generally growing it for, like that root, that swollen root part. Bigger, um, bigger root crops like big turnips, rutabaga, um, kohlrabi. Um, kohlrabi is actually not a root crop. Kohl, the part of kohlrabi that we eat is actually just a swollen stem, which is pretty neat. Um, it's it's um, just the stem of the plant that gets really swollen. But anyway, those three, if you, um, you generally um, fertilize them when you plant them. And then if it seems like you need it about a month before harvest, but not really not more than that, because otherwise you end up with much more leaf growth and not as much root or swollen stem growth. Okay. And then last but not least are heads, um, like the dense heads of things. Um, so things like uh, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, um, those sorts of things. You generally um, fertilize those two to three times because it takes a lot of energy to form those heads. Um, those are crops that are usually in the ground for over two months, um, sometimes, sometimes three months um, before you, you harvest them. And so two or, three, two or three times is usually good for fertilizing. And then, so, so you fertilize them that many times, but how much do you fertilize them? What do you fertilize them with? Um, and what you fertilize them with is really a personal decision. Um, and, um, you know, whether it be, you know, like an organic sort of product or uh, um, conventional product, liquid, um, granular, it's really, um, that's something um, for you to make a personal decision about. But the thing that is very important is that whatever product you decide to use, um, read the directions on there. Um, it's really, really easy to over fertilize things um, because we kind of have this general tendency to think that more is better. More is not better um, when it comes to fertilizer. Um, more causes um, some, some insect um, issues as we already talked about. Um, it also is just a waste of waste of money. Um, and all that excess fertilizer actually leaches through our really sandy soils and can get down into our drinking water. And that's not a good thing. So um, I have um, it's all sorts of things happening on my phone. Um, I'm hoping that's not Kevin trying to call in. Um, I don't recognize the phone number. Okay. Um, so 
spacing is the next the next thing. Let me check the chat to make sure. Okay, not you. Great, thank you. Sorry, y'all. This has been a little bit choppier than I'm used to on on um, on Zoom. So with spacing, I love I love this picture. Um, this is um, a few years ago. I was working on campus at the University of Florida. Um, managing a sustainable agriculture teaching farm on campus. So I had seven acres of, um, of space that I got to use to do demos and side-by-side um, -side trials with students on campus. And so we did all sorts of, you know, side-by-sides, you know, if you, if you plant it like this compared to this compared to this, what happens? And this is um, a fully mature cauliflower. Um, and as you can see, it's very, very tiny. So this is, <laughs> this is a cauliflower plant that got planted much, much too close. Um, and we didn't end up having um, mold, mold, mildew, and disease issues with this particular crop of cauliflower. But as you can see, those are some mighty small stunted plants. Um, and if you space um, the roots too closely together um, of the root crops, um, you get really odd misshapen radishes and turnips and rutabagas. Um, as well as early bolting. Um, and bolting is the fancy farming term for produces a flower. Um, producing a flower is the last thing that, that annual crops do um, before they decide to die. And then really the worst thing that happens if you plant things too far apart is that you've wasted some space. Um, there's maybe some more space for weeds to pop up. Um, and then if you have really heavy plants, they might be unstable, but you can just um, stake those up. So better to err on the side of too, too far apart than too close together, especially when it's hot and humid out. Hmm. Having trouble getting my screen to change again. There we go. So I put um, these pictures of the, the front and back and a close up of a seed packet on here because I want to point this out really quickly. I'm guessing a lot of folks have already figured out that um, the instructions on seed packets often just don't make sense for Florida. So, you know, for example, if you try to grow um, kohlrabi in, in the late summer here, you will not have success. It is just too stinking hot for kohlrabi in the summer here. Um, and, um, you know, and, and you can see here that you can, however, follow the planting, like the, the spacing information, but you're going to need to use a different resource to figure out um, when to plant in Florida. In general, ignore the planting date suggestions on, on seed packets in Florida. Here's another example, um, Mizuna mustard. It's a, you know, a very frost tolerant mustard from a very cold region of, of Asia. If you planted this in the late summer, you would have a pretty spectacular um, failure. You can see over here that um, when this, they like, um, you should um, plant six, four to six weeks before the average last frost date um, when the soil temperature is at least 40 degrees, right? That's, that's not a good rule of thumb for Florida. So um, really, really taking um, the suggestions on seed packets with a grain of salt is a good idea. Okay, so a little side note on spacing. So traditionally, and you'll see this on seed packets, um, things like um, things that produce big heads like, like broccoli and cabbage are traditionally have been spaced like two to three feet in all directions. And that results in really big heads, you know, like those big heads of, of broccoli and cabbage and things like that. Um, but for most families, we just don't eat vegetables in those kind of quantities anymore. Um, and so if you s intentionally space those a little bit closer together, you get you get smaller heads, which are much more appropriate size for, for most families. Um, you know, when, when we had families that averaged, you know, eight or nine people, big heads was a really good idea. And now that our families are more like, you know, three or four people, a small head is a much better idea. Um, so succession planting is this idea of in order to always have um, something, something ready to harvest, there's a lot of things you have to plant over and over again. So there's a whole list of things that um, you plant one time, you harvest it and it's done. And if you want it again, you have to plant it again and again. Um, and if you want a continuous harvest of something, you should ideally be planting this small amounts of whatever that, that thing is that you love as a staple in your diet like every week. You know, like if you really, really, really love um, radishes, for example, um, planting radishes once a week for a few months um, 
just, you know, just a few radishes will keep you, you know, fully stocked with radishes every week. Um, and um, so just something to think about. Um, it's, sometimes it's better for, for, for families to plant a little bit of something multiple times than to plant a whole lot of something once. Um, you know, if you plant, you know, 10 feet of radishes all on the same day, you're going to have 10, 10 bunches of radishes worth of radishes. And that's a lot of radishes. Um, or, or over 10 weeks, you could plant one foot of radish at a time and then always have one bunch of wheat ready. Um, other things um, you get more harvest out of. Um, and then um, just some odds and ends um, that are just as a suggestion. Um, a lot of people are, um, who've never grown things like broccoli before are really surprised that you harvest a head of broccoli and then that's kind of it. Um, you waited, you know, some two and a half months to get that head of broccoli um, and then you harvested it and it's, it's done. You got your head of broccoli. But if you like to have um, a much more consistent supply of broccoli, there's some varieties that are um, that don't ever produce that big central head. Instead, they just send up lots and lots and lots of shoots. And so this list down here, um, Dicicio, uh, there should be another I in there, Dicicio, um, Happy Rich and Atlantis are three, three varieties of broccoli that just, um, they just produce shoots for weeks and sometimes months. Um, and they're also delicious. Um, and then some folks actually really like to grow radishes and turnips for the greens and not just the roots. Um, I actually really love radish and turnip greens. I cook them and think they're delicious. So that's another one that you can, you can plant differently if you want to. Um, and when folks are really um, trying to figure out how, like, how much am I going to get out of this garden space, um, a really good rule of thumb is that if you eat the part that's a root or a head, you get one harvest out of it, right? Like you pull one radish out, that radish is not going to regrow. That was, that was the radish. Um, and same with, you know, like cabbage. You harvest that one head, that's it. Um, and then if you, but if you harvest, sorry, if you, if the part of the plant that you eat is a leaf, you can generally assume that you're going to get two to 10 harvests out of that plant. So if you plant collard greens, um, you can generally harvest like three-ish, three to four leaves a week off of, and sometimes more if, if the plants are really, really healthy, sometimes significantly more, but you can probably harvest three to four leaves a week for about 10, 10 or so weeks off of those collard plants. Um, so watering can be a really tricky, um, a really tricky thing to figure out. Um, in general, most of the brassicas that we like to eat um, in Florida grow during the dry time of year. You know, it's just it's just too hot um, and wet during our, our rainy season for pretty much any of the brassicas to be healthy. So we have to give them water. Um, and it can be really, it can be really um, kind of like a Goldilocks and the Three Bears type kind of scenario of figuring out how much is too much water and not enough. Um, but some rules of thumb is that just remember that the smaller the plant is, the less water it needs. That doesn't mean it needs water less frequently. Um, it just needs less water um, each time you water it. Um, and bigger plants clearly need um, more water. They, they take a lot of water up. Um, and then mulching, mulching your soil really helps um, conserve that, conserve the moisture that is in, in the soil. So mulching with something like, my, one of my favorite things to mulch with in Florida is Spanish moss. Um, it works quite well. Okay, so that is it for the, the growing part of things. And I realized that I have already shot past my one hour of talking. I think I have something like seven more minutes um, of actually talking. And I'm gonna show you recipes. So I grew up in the southeast and um, I have a deep, deep love of collard greens boiled for eight hours with ham hock. Um, I think that it is delicious. Um, and um, it's also maybe not the healthiest thing in the world. Um, and so over the years, I have had the um, truly amazing opportunity to do a lot of traveling and seeing how other cultures eat things um, and, and see what's normal and how other cultures prepare things that I grew up eating a really different way. So I'm gonna show you some recipes from around the world. Um, and I, I haven't followed, and, I, and I'll say upfront, I have not actually 
followed any of these recipes to a T, but these are all um, these are all things that I have cooked something similar to and actually cook things. I, I cook these things regularly um, myself, you know, just from just from um, cooking with families around the world. So I, I found some recipes that are really similar to things that I've eaten around the world and regularly eat in my own home. Okay. So I'm just gonna go region by region and show you some of the different things that these different regions eat, um, how they eat collard greens. Because I think collard greens are, are, are really are an amazing vegetable um, and they, um, they grow so well in Florida for the vast majority of the, of the year. So um, this is a, this picture and, and all of the pictures are directly off of the websites that, co that correspond with the, um, the websites that um, website links that I have in the PowerPoint. Um, those are pictures that are directly directly connected. So um, a few years ago when I was still farming, um, there was a really big trend towards um, vegan raw restaurants in the area that I was um, that I was selling to. And one of the biggest things that um, I would get orders for were young um, young soft collard green leaves that were used in place of spring roll wrappers to make totally vegan raw um, spring rolls. Um, and a lot of these restaurants would feed me when I would go and drop, um, drop things off. And let me tell you, um, collard greens used as like a you know, sushi wrapper or a, um, a spring roll wrapper are so good. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a really good example of how um, a, a twist on, on American cuisine um, I've, I've tried something really similar to this one time. This is a, you know, a twist on a really traditional um, Southeast United States um, combination of foods, you know, barbecue sauce, black eyed peas, and collard greens. There's also some rice in there. Um, I've tried something similar to this before and it is delicious. Um, this is basically a take on like a, a, um, a Middle Eastern dolma you know, where they use grape leaves um, to wrap up the ingredients, but in this case, they're using collard leaves. Um, so good. I recommend giving it a try. Um, and then, you know, here, here's another variation on, on um, you know, like a dolma or Mediterranean stuffed grape leaf type thing, except using um, collard greens instead. Um, and then we move down to Brazil. Um, let me move this little thing out of the way. I can see my screen all the way. Um, so Brazil, um, parts of Brazil eat a lot of collard greens. It's a very staple vegetable in a lot of parts of, of Brazil. Um, and can you see how like ribbon-like um, the, the greens are and how, um, how like light, light green those leaves are? Those leaves have not been cooked for very long. They were, they were cut in a very fine, like a very fine little ribbon. Um, and then basically just kind of like a steamed, kind of steamed with lime and paprika and salt and um, delicious. This is um, another, another variation on that from um, actually from Martha Stewart um, magazine or website. Um, and again, you can see like that, just that really finely processed down collard green. We tend to, in our culture in the Southeast United States have big hunks of collard greens, which can be kind of intimidating. Um, but chopping it really fine can be a great way to cook them really, really quickly. The, the smaller you cook them, or the smaller you chop them, the quicker they cook and the more nutrients they, they retain. This, I, this is a really busy screen, I realize that, uh, but I just wanted to, sh to show you the, the full recipe here. This is an Ethiopian collard green recipe. Um, this is a really traditional Ethiopian dish um, that again, you know, just has so much flavor, you know, like lemon and chili and cardamom and coriander and paprika, onion, garlic, ginger, right? Like there's just, there's so much flavor infused in that. Um, and we, you know, we tend to get stuck in our little cooking ruts. And so I love just piling in the flavor. And then moving a little further down in Africa, um, a lot of a lot of parts of Africa um, use peanuts and peanut butter as a as a significant staple to their diet. Um, and um, dishes like like the one that you see on your screen right here, like a um, a chicken stew with collard greens and peanuts, is something that I've eaten a lot 
in, um, in parts of Africa. Um, and it is delicious. Um, I, collard greens and peanut butter are, um, they don't sound like they would be an amazing combination, but they are. Um, and then this is, um, this is a dish from, from Kenya um, that, I, um, that I also ate um, in, um, in Tanzania. And, um, and I, one of the things I love about this, um, this dish, it's called Sukuma Wiki. Um, I, I worked for quite a few years with refugees in this country that were from that general part of the world. And, um, and Sukuma was, um, we talked about Sukuma all the time. Sukuma means um, collard greens. And um, everything was Sukuma, Sukuma, Sukuma. It was just such um, an important um, staple in, in so many people's diets. And only recently did I realize, or did I discover that the um, Sukuma Wiki, um, which is Swahili, um, translates loosely to mean stretch the week, which means that, you know, like if you have just a little bit of meat, um, if you add enough collard greens, it stretches that meat out enough that you can, you get to eat meat across the whole week by, by stretching it out with some, with a big pile of collard greens. Um, and then the last region of the world um, that where collard greens is really um, a folk a real focal point of their cuisine is actually Portugal. Um, some of y'all may have heard of caldo verde, um, which is a pretty traditional um, Portuguese soup. Um, there, um, you know, th those right there are the very simple ingredients that go into um, caldo verde. Um, it's a, you know, it's incredibly delicious. You can also make it without the sausage um, and just add some additional spices to make up for some of that sausage flavor. Um, and um, I think that's the last recipe that I have there. Um, when I did this class in person, I had a pile of collard greens and I actually did a little demonstration of how to achieve that really finely chopped ribbon cut on collard greens so that, they, they, um, so that they're easier to eat and you don't have to cook them as long. Um, I'm not even, I don't have any, I, this is kind of like sacrilege in my household, but I don't have any collard greens or kale or anything in my house right now to show you how to do this with. Um, but, this, um, but this fantastic little website that I stumbled upon actually has like a picture tutorial of how to do it. Um, and the basic principle is that you roll the collard greens up into a tube and then kind of um, cut, cut the tube long ways and then cut the tube um, short ways. And um, you just get, to get a really quick ribboning of your collard greens. So um, I think that that is it. And um, I'm gonna get off of screen share now. Let's see, stop share so I can see all your faces. Great, okay. Um, so that's what I've got. I talked entirely longer than I intended to, which is not atypical for me. Um, and um, I, um, I am happy to take any and all questions um, for the next 45 minutes. Um, they can be about collard greens, other brassicas, um, growing pumpkins. They can be anything about gardening, how to get your hands on locally produced food right now, um, anything and everything. So if you type your questions into chat, um, Katie is going to um, it's going to read questions to me, I believe. And um, thank you, thank you all for being on the call. Um, and if any, um, and before before we get going with questions, um, I'll also just say that um, when this webinar is over, we are going to send all of you uh, an email um, to say thank you. Um, and also, it will contain a link to a survey. Um, we, we usually just have you do surveys or ask that you do surveys in person um, when we do in-person in classes. Um, but since we don't have that option right now, um, we're going to send you a link. Um, I think there's maybe six questions that should take you quite literally maybe two minutes to do the survey. Um, and we very, very, very much um, appreciate um, your, your response to surveys. Um, there's something that I, that I need. Um, as part of justifying um, the work that we all do, um, but it also helps me figure out um, what I'm what I'm missing, like, you know, what I'm not doing a great job of, what I can do better the next time around, and things like that. So, um, so thank you in advance for filling out that survey and let the questions roll, and I'll do my best to answer things as they come in. All right. So the first question has come in. 
And it is, what is your favorite collard green recipe? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, recently I've really been enjoying adding collard greens into pasta sauce. Um, I love, I love just, you know, like regular old like tomato pasta sauce. Um, and um, I just, uh, I cut up those greens tiny, tiny, tiny so that they're in, can you see my hand? Like little squares about that big. And I can square up an entire bunch of collard greens in about 30 seconds using that, like roll up a tube, cut it in one direction, cut in the other. Um, and then I just add an entire, an entire huge bunch of collard greens into a batch of tomato sauce and it's, it's delicious. And then um, it, makes, it makes eating noodles feel healthy. <laughs> um, and then yes, Kevin, um, collard green pesto is delicious. Um, I've actually been eating a whole lot of kale pesto since we've been home in quarantine. Um, I love pesto made out of pretty much anything. I haven't met a vegetable yet that I don't like in pesto form. Um, and um, co collard green pesto is delicious. It tastes, it tastes green and healthy and, and just abundant with, with good stuff. Um, and while other questions start to filter in, I'm going to talk a little bit more about another one of my favorite pestos. Um, so I know a lot, a lot of people have kind of a love-hate relationship with fennel, um, you know, like fresh fennel you can get at the farmer's market. Um, you know, we, we typically just eat the bottom part of a fennel, like the fennel bulb. Um, but then three quarters of the plant, we generally tend to just kind of toss when we're done with it, like that ferny, sweet, um, really pungent top. Um, it makes delicious pesto. Um, when you actually blend it up with, with nuts and olive oil and you know, lemon juice and salt and things like that, um, the, that, that kind of sweet um, licorice flavor goes away. And it's a great way to take a vegetable where you would normally just toss three quarters of it and actually turn it into a really good, good meal. Other questions? It's so, it's so interesting doing, doing things via webinar. So sometimes there's so many questions and sometimes there's not. And in person, there's always lots and lots of questions. So, never so we got one about that. whether it'll be available as a recorded version. Yeah. And that's a yes. Yes. It will be available. And then we had another question come in. What's the most difficult part of growing brassica here? The heat, the water, or the pests? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, it is it's the pests. Um, the pests are pretty, pretty significant. Um, yeah. Um, you know, and, and it all depends too on what brassica you're talking about. So, you know, some, some of the brassicas like, um, the, you know, things like radishes or um, a lot of the Asian greens, they, they're really made for relatively cool weather. Um, and even in the winter, when those temperatures spike, um, you know, up into the 80s um, for a few days, you can have, um, you know, like a tot soy or a, um, something like that that's, that's chugging along just fine and it's almost ready to harvest. And then all of a sudden it has a two foot tall flower sticking out of the middle of it. Um, and so some of the brassicas, the heat is, is a really, is really tricky, but I would say in general, it is, it's the pests. They're significant. And then I see another question popped up on the nuts that I like to put in with fennel pesto. So I spent entirely too much of my life, not too much of my life, but I spent much of my life um, as, a, as a farmer with very, very little um, expendable income. So I have actually only used pine nuts a few times in my whole life, generally because my mother has given them to me um, <laughs> as a gift. Um, and so I've always used um, other other kinds of seeds and nuts in pesto. Um, so when I do fennel pesto, um, I prefer either walnuts or pumpkin seeds. Um, I also frequently will use sunflower seeds um, for pesto. Um, and um, I, I love it. You know, every kind of nut just gives a different flavor. Um, sometimes when I wanna get really fancy, I'll toast some pecans um, and then let them fully cool. Um, and use that as the as the nut that I use with um, with basil. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. And then do you want to do you want to read that, Katie, or you want me to? 
I was going I to read it. it. Yeah. 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 So we got a suggestion from an attendee that there's a great show on PBS called Somewhere South. Um, and recently there was an episode on collard and Chef Vivian Howard traveled throughout the South meeting different cultures like uh, Asian and they cooked different collards. So it's worth watching. Awesome. That's super fun. You know, there's a, um, another show that I, I love watching um, called the, Sh um, oh gosh, I just blanked on the name, The Chef's Table. And they, they just, um, in the last season, did an episode on a Southern chef um, in, in, this, in this country. Um, and she, um, she's a chef in Savannah, Georgia. And there's a lot of really wonderful, um, a, lo a lot of wonderful footage of her cooking collard greens and talking about just culturally what collard greens mean to her. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty neat it's a pretty neat show also, good, and good to know on the Somewhere South. I've actually never watched that, but I've heard it's great. Um, okay, any commercial brassica operations in Florida? And if so, is it a sizable crop for our ag producers? Um, great question. So there, um, there's nobody that, that I am aware of that's doing like, you know, a large, large scale monocrop of, you know, just one type of brassica. Um, there's a handful of um, smaller farms that, you know, grow, uh, you know, 10 or 20 or 40 different kinds of vegetables and sell mostly to farmers markets and um, restaurants and um, hotel kitchens and things like that. Um, and there's a, a dozen, somewhere between a dozen and a 20 and 20 ish um, farms that fit more into that category in, um, in Sarasota County. Um, but then in Florida in general, um, yes, um, Florida is actually, um, I think, I'm trying to think, I, either, either the top or the second state in the whole country in cabbage production. Um, and that, that's almost all done in um, the northern tier of Florida, um, up where it, it's, it's much cooler in the winter because cabbage much prefers cold weather, but there's, there's um, farms in the northern part of Florida that have like a solid 20,000 acre block of cabbage. Um, so, so Florida really cranks out some cabbage. Um, and then there's, there's definitely also other, other brassicas grown in really large quantities um, in, in, with larger farms, almost all um, further north though in Florida. Brassicas just, we're, we're kind of at, you know, like we're just, it's just so hot down here. Um, and then, oh yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Cabbage. Let's see. Home gardeners, do you need to rotate crops like large scale producers? So that's a really good question. So um, the question that, that Kevin just typed in is for home gardens, do you need to rotate crops like large scale producers do to keep from depleting resources? So, um, it, it can be really tricky on if, if you really just have, you know, like a couple of little garden beds um, to do some significant rotating around of crops, right? You know, like if you're working with like two four by eight foot beds, there's only so much rotation you can do. Um, and there's two reasons that you would rotate your, your plants around, the different families of plants. And one is that um, diseases kind of build up in one spot. Um, and diseases tend to be fairly specific to each family of plants. So if you rotate around, like on big farms, we rotate around to, you know, different fields to give, to give those diseases a chance to kind of calm down a little bit um, and the disease pressure to, to calm down. Um, but in a, in a small space, it's, it's really hard to do. Um, but if you can give a raised bed a break, um, you know, for a year or more, that's a, that's a great, it's a great thing to do. Um, and then, um, then the other reason that you would rotate things around is because certain, each, each family of plants um, has, um, has an affinity for certain, certain quantities of certain nutrients. So some plants are going to pull, you know, like way more phosphorus out of the soil um, compared to another plant that might pull way more manganese out of the soil. So you in, sometimes can end up with some imbalances. Um, and so in order to keep things a little more balanced, it's a great idea to rotate things around if you have enough space to rotate around. Um, and then if you're just not sure, you know, how your soil's doing, it's a great idea to send a soil sample into a lab to test it. 
um, and you'll um, you'll get a you'll get a really really good glimpse into what's happening in your soil. Um, the tests are always the test results are always really confusing, so I always encourage people to just when you get your test results back, give us a call and we'll help you understand what all those numbers are and what you do with them. Um, yeah. Anything else? <laughs> Trying to remember some of the questions that that folks asked when we did the in-person class. Oh, nematodes were a really big subject. Would that be, would it be helpful to talk a little bit about some ways you can control nematodes? Um, yes, okay. <laughs> um, so there are indeed different ways you can go about controlling nematodes. Um, the first thing that's really helpful is to know what kind of nematodes you're dealing with. Um, University of Florida actually has um, an entire nematology department. Um, they have their, their own building because um, it's such a huge, it's such a huge subject um, and it has such a huge impact on, on agriculture in Florida. Um, so um, there is a nematode testing lab. Um, so you can send in a little sample just like you would do um, if you wanted to test your soil. Um, you'd send in a little soil sample to the nematode lab and they will give you a report um, and they'll tell you exactly what kind of nematodes you have and um, they give you a spectrum um, of how badly infested, infected your soil is with those types of nematodes from just kind of background levels to good luck ever growing anything in the soil kind of level. Um, and then once you know what kind of nematodes you're dealing with, um, that gives us a lot more information to help you actually make a good plan to, to control those nematodes. Because um, some of them just, they just respond differently than others. Um, so nematodes, um, one, of the, one of the things that, that folks um, find a decent amount of success with is to do something called solarizing your soil. And it's kind of a double-edged sword. So the way that solarizing works is during the summer when it is so hot um, and so humid and there's so much rain that it's hard to keep things growing, um, is you cover your soil, like the nematode infested soil that you have, um, with a really in dark colored um, tarp, um, or um, some clear, some very thick clear plastic, and it greatly increases the, the temperature of the soil underneath it. Basically, it's like putting it in an oven. It cooks that soil, um, and you have to leave that tarp or that clear plastic down for a few weeks, um, pre preferably even longer than a few weeks, like, like all of July and August is a really good, good time frame. Um, and it really, really, really knocks back the population of nematodes. Um, for some folks, it'll actually fully, um, fully take care of the nematodes. Um, some, for some folks, their nematode population is, um, is so significant that it, that it might not knock it back all the way. But, um, so the double-edged sword part of that is that it also kills everything else that's in your soil and kills all the good stuff too. Um, and so if you, if you do go with the route of solarizing your soil, which a, whole, a lot of people do because it is pretty effective, um, it's a really good idea to add good stuff back into your soil um, so that you start rebuilding the beneficial microbial life in your soil that's a necessary part of, of keeping healthy soil. So adding you know, compost or composted manure or um, some worm castings or um, those sorts of things, like just kind of get things, get things cranking again. Um, if, you, if you want to go the chemical route, there are um, nematicides on the market. Um, and um, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a chemical that's you know, similar to you know, something like a, um, an herbicide or a pesticide or a fungicide, but it's a, it's chemically, um, it's a chemical compound to control nematodes. Um, it's not ne nematode, um, nematicides are not nearly as effective as, um, as most pesticides are. Um, nematodes are just really, really hard to kill. So even with you know pretty hardcore conventional nematicides, um, it's, it can be really tricky. Um, and then there's there's growing research about you know using um, brassicas, um, especially certain varieties of arugula seem to be really um, really high in those compounds that control um, they control nematodes. Um, there's some amount of inconclusive research about um, marigolds. Um, 
And then there's, um, there is more and more research about certain kinds of cover crops. Um, and a cover crop is something that's used on a farm typically. Um, and it's a crop that's intentionally planted um, with no intention of harvesting it. So you, you plant it um, and it's there to hold soil in place, to build up more biomass in place, um, to help control um, you know, flooding during the, the wet time of year. And then when you're ready to plant again, you mow that crop down and either leave it on the surface of the soil or till it under and then plant again. So that's a fairly common practice on a farm. It's a little harder to do in a garden, but it's possible. And there's a handful of cover crops that grow really, really well in the summer here that are showing some really strong potential to help control nematodes. Um, but they, they tend to be kind of, they can, they can be difficult um, cover crops um, for, for home gardeners because of how, how just big and, and woody some of the plants get. Um, so that's, that's a little bit more about controlling nematodes. Um, and if it's, you know, if you're using raised beds, which I said earlier, that's the hardest way, uh, or that's the, the happiest place for nematodes is in a raised bed. Um, they love that environment. You may have to just dig out all the old soil um, and, um, and start over again. Um, some folks kind of get to that point of, um, just, I give up. <laughs> um, it's time to start over with a raised bed. Other questions? Nothing? Going once, going twice? <laughs> um, well, unless other questions come in, um, I would just love to say thank you all so very much. Um, I wish I um, could be talking with all of you in person, um, not being able to see people's faces and have a conversation during class is a totally strange thing. Um, we're all getting used to it. Um, oh, one more question came in. Um, and um, but um, you know, I thank you for for sticking with our our funny new format, um, and um, we very much look forward to um, getting back around to actually being able to see you all in person again someday, and having a very hands-on experience where we can go out to the demo garden and touch these things and look at these things and stick things under a microscope and all of that. But um, um, so I'll, um, I will answer. Um, go ahead and um, log out if you need to, and I'll just keep answering questions if there's just if, if there's other questions that come in and I will start with um, Henry's question on intercropping with brassicas so yeah intercropping with brassicas um, can be um, can be great um, there's there's all sorts of theories about plants that do intercrop well together and plants that don't um, there are some things that they produce a set of chemicals that may kind of suppress the growth of something else um, in, in general, grass, brassicas grow, grow well with things. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of the big brassicas, they, they provide a nice kind of shady canopy for some of the other um, heat sensitive crops that you want to grow, to grow up under. Um, so they can produ produce some nice, nice canopy in there. Um, I, I grow, I interplant all sorts of things. I, I, I love planting things in big, um, in big jumbled, um, jumbled clusters um, and just see, seeing how different things how different things grow um, and then and one actually one little side note also so um, that I've totally forgot to mention when we were talking about recipes is so rem, so if you were gardening and um, getting frustrated that you know when you're growing broccoli or cauliflower that it takes two and a half months to get that one head and then you throw away three quarters of the plant just remember that botanically, um, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, collards, cabbage, they're all the same plant, right? So you can eat cauliflower leaves, broccoli leaves, those outer cabbage leaves. They all taste pretty much like collard greens um, and they are absolutely delicious. So um, get in the habit of eating the parts that you don't usually see in the grocery store. Um, they're really good. And then it doesn't feel like you've just um, you know, um, dedicated an entire half of a four by four foot bed to a single head of broccoli for two and a half months. Um, you, you know, you, you get more out of it than that. So um, yeah, be creative, um, eat things, try things, nibble on stuff, um, and just have fun with planting, interplanting things. Um, 
Yeah. Anything else? Nothing. Okay. Well, I thank you all. Have fun eating. I hope that you can get your hands on big piles of, of brassicas and be creative um, with eating them. I'm going to make a trip to the grocery store for the first time in a couple of weeks tomorrow, and I am going to load up on all sorts of vegetables, including collard greens. <laughs> so um, I hope you enjoyed. And in, I think, a couple of weeks, I'm going to do a class on soil. And it's going to be the same sort of format where I'm going to talk I'm going to aim for an hour. It'll probably turn into an hour and a quarter and then have somewhere between an hour and 45 minutes for questions. Um, but we're going to do a, a deep dive into Florida soil. So hope to see some of you then. And thank you so very much. Stay safe and be well. And I'm, let's go ahead and die. <laughs>